I think there's something to love about every level, but the part that I found most interesting was the level that's called the Glade Estate, where it's a combination of both a Glade area and a wealthy estate. And in this level, the the adventure girl eats something that she's not supposed to from the yeah. kitchen, and there's a you know there's a salute to Alice in Wonderland because she grows large, and uh, it's up to four and a half her companion to figure out a way to restore her to regular size. And what I thought was really interesting about this level from a gameplay perspective is that it's very full of character interaction and character yeah. development. So you've got the the conspiring cards sitting around the campfire and they're going to come into play later in the games. So you're you're seeing them in an early phase and there's this frenetic nervous cook who's really funny. <laughs> so um and I think it's a level where we start to learn a little bit more about four and a half, the, the card companions yeah. with her. So for me, this is a really interesting level from a story standpoint. Uh, for me, as a composer, I most liked the clock room or the, the wow. clock area, which is earlier in the game. There's a little bit of a primacy bias because it was the first cue that I wrote and, you know, the beginning of a project, you're always full of energy and oh, yeah. uh, excitement. But what was fun about this level for me is that the sound designer, Alex May and I, decided that the music should go at 60 beats per minute. So it has a kind of a tick-tock uh, clock-like quality to it. And the room is full of clocks that are also going 60 beats per minute exactly, which is what you'd expect from a clock. But the music and the clocks are not synchronized. So even though they're going the same tempo, they're not in lockstep with each other. They're always a little bit off from one another. So there's a sense of everything being in sync, but at the same time, everything is a little bit off. And the, the rhythmic interactions between the the sound design and the music are really fun from an acoustic standpoint. So that was a that was a really fun area for me to score. From a technical standpoint, I think the most difficult part was uh, the scene early on where the girl is falling down the rabbit hole for the first time, and you know it's a very visually striking moment because she's just tumbling over and over again. And I think especially if you're watching this in VR. It's it's probably very intense. Uh, so the, the problem there, from a technical standpoint, is we don't know how long the girl is going to be falling. It's a potentially infinite fall because the duration depends on when the player exits the, the area by solving some problems. So the traditional way to handle a potentially infinite experience from a music standpoint is just to have the music loop. The, the problem there is that the the experience is very dynamic. You know, there's this constant sense of descending. And when you loop music, it tends to feel very static. It's very much the same thing. Like you'll typically have a beat or a rhythmic pattern and you don't often change the key of the music. So it feels very linear and we didn't want that. So the solution, um, the solution was to use a, a musical resource called the whole tone scale. And this is just what happens if you're on the piano and you skip a note, you know, you play C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, mm -hmm. A sharp, and then you're back to C. Or in our case, we went down the scale. And this is something that's often used in classic animation to convey climbing up or falling down. And what's nice about that scale is it's completely symmetrical. Every step is the same distance from the other and it ends up where it starts. So you can descend down the whole tone scale and it feels like you're continually going down and it's very easy to loop. So that felt like the, the perfect accompaniment to a potentially infinite fall. And I think that got us out of the, the problem of how we can loop elegantly in something that can go on forever. It's not a very imaginative answer on my part, but I just love the main character. Oh the, yeah. The anonymous girl. I don't think we ever learn her name. No. And I think I think it's just because the the player is meant it's meant to be the player essentially. It's the player's avatar in the world. So uh, it's not like Alice where she has a very well defined history. But visually, she's just so much fun. She's got this kind of adventury look to her that just makes yeah. her very enjoyable. And there is a sense of a personality of somebody who's kind of spunky and tough and brave. So. 
visually, I've just always thought she's, uh, she's probably mm -hmm. my favorite. Sure. There were two things that really struck me about this game. One was the visual design. Mm -hmm. which I, I just love, I've, I've said this over and over, I just love the visual design of this game. The artwork is evocative, it has a storybook quality, yeah. but at the same time it feels a little contemporary, so it doesn't feel like it was literally cribbed out of uh, the Alice in Wonderland books. It's evocative of that tradition, but completely original. And that makes my job easier, because as a composer, I get to watch the same gameplay mm -hmm. footage over and over again. So when the uh, artwork is pretty, it just makes things easier for me. Really? The, uh, the, yeah, well, I mean, you know, you're seeing the same gameplay footage. You can't constantly be playing the game when you're composing. So uh, yes, the, the artist uh, did me a big favor there. And I think secondly, just the, the, the VR paradigm of this game, which is very difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't seen it, uh, struck me as really unique and interesting. And the, the idea that you, the player, not the player in the game, but you, the person, the person with the camera are descending a rabbit hole, essentially descending down this cylinder, and you're looking around and seeing the action of the game on these levels around you in 360 degrees. That's a terrible description, so it's easier to you know you you obviously know what it looks like, and everyone in Cortopia does. But it's so such an interesting and original approach to VR and the issue of are you looking through somebody's eyes or oh, yeah. are you looking at them from above? Uh, I, I just loved that from, from first blush. This is my second. Uh, okay. I did I did a, a ghost shooter game, also a collaboration with, with Alex May uh, a couple of years before. Uh, if memory serves, and memory isn't always great, um, <laughs> the the ghost game was a very traditional first person shooter and i believe it was i believe it was first person don't don't yell at me if i'm misremembering but it was a very traditional like you are in the world you're looking around and down the rabbit hole the you as the camera are looking from above you're looking from uh, like a story viewing perspective uh -huh. and you have a visual position in this world you know this this kind of ant farm paradigm where you're seeing everything around you and you can rotate and get a different view. Uh, I think it's more fun to watch things from a third person perspective because you get to see the facial expression of the main character. Uh, let's see, I had two and I think I accidentally oh. mentioned them in prior questions. Uh, <laughs> one was the, the trick we did with the clock room where we synchronized, we semi-synchronized the, the music and the clocks. Uh, there were no technical failures, fortunately. Uh, I never, I never had a catastrophic studio blackout or anything like that. It was, it was a fairly smooth and enjoyable experience. It's a lot of fun. I, I am enjoying seeing it win all the acknowledgements and denominations, but I'm not surprised because it's such a yeah. creative game. I am definitely a supporting member of the team, but I was very pleased to be contributing to this game.